Hello friends, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making. I'm here in the shop. It is a cold, brisk morning and uh, I just fired up the wood stove here. So while that is warming up the shop and basically bringing me to life and getting the feeling back into my fingertips, we're gonna go ahead and answer your questions. Let's do Q&A. Okay, friends, and let's just go ahead and get right into it. I'm going to start with the question of the week, which in this case is actually the question of the last three weeks. That happens a lot, actually. Question of the week isn't always what it seems. Sometimes I let the question hang out there a little bit longer, uh, either because I'm too lazy to put a new one up or I forget, uh, but more commonly, actually, I will leave it out there just so that I can, because it's a good question and I want to see if I can get more responses and more answers to it um, before I'm satisfied with the, the dialogue that we have going back and forth. And that was the case with this one. The question of the week was, about three weeks ago, what sharpening system or set of stones, uh, just what method do you use for sharpening? Because there's a lot of different methods out there. And uh, I've already read some previous ones in, in other episodes uh, about what other people do, but we've gotten a couple, in that time, we've gotten a couple more responses. And so I'll go ahead and share those with you. ASAT11 writes that he uses the WorkSharp 3000, which actually that's what I use too. Um, and after I go through these, I'll probably talk about that a little bit when I talk about what I do. Doc Joe says, I used the Scary Sharp workflow with 3M abrasives and glass plates. Very good. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything you know negative or positive to say about that. Uh, I, I, I've done that before. Well, I guess one thing I'll say is uh, it uses a lot of paper and uh, and the time spent you know pulling out the paper and cutting it to size and everything. Uh, this, that isn't to say it's a bad system. Whatever gets you to sharp is great. Uh, I'm just, I guess, sharing the fact that I started that early on but moved away from it just to have something that was more at the ready, meaning my work sharp is literally bolted down to the table over there. So it's like a permanent station and I just walk up and, you know, give my chisels and plane blades a little tune-up over there. Um, and uh, you can get the same thing, though, with a, a stone, because stones, you know, you can store them right under your bench and just pull them out. Having things ready to go like that means you're going to use it more. Again, not knocking uh, the fact that he uses that scary sharp method and, and sandpaper. That can work, too. Okay. Yeah, and a good glass plate. Uh, something that's reliably flat for something like the scary sharp system. That's great. Doc Brown, who is new, by the way, I'm going to read his new member introduction in just a moment. Doc Brown is new to the forum and new to the online guitar building school, and he writes, My setup includes Shapton Stones, Sorby Sharpening System, oh, nice, and a pair of CBN grinding wheels and a piece of granite for sandpaper. Okay, very cool. I like it. Uh, so yeah, like I said, I use the WorkSharp 3000, which I have over there. Here, I'll just briefly show it to you. Um, I'm only showing it to you for your interest here. There's, um, there's no sponsorship or anything like that. I don't do that kind of stuff. But um, it is a great tool, so I will say that very honestly. And one other thing I'll say on the topic while we're talking about sharpening our chisels and plane blades is that I have switched to, I'm a big fan of having three bevels. I'm not sure if you can see that. So many of you are familiar with the concept of having a primary bevel and a micro bevel. Um, I have been convinced of the idea of actually having three bevels instead of just a primary and a micro bevel. You could call it the primary bevel, the micro bevel, and the 
super micro bevel if you want, whatever you want to call it, or the nano bevel, perhaps. Uh, so the reason for that really is just ease of sharpening off of that smallest of bevels, right? So a micro bevel, the purpose of a micro bevel is so that you don't have to work on the very large surface area of the primary bevel every time you go to sharpen it. If you don't have a micro bevel, you are working through a lot of steel every time you go to sharpen your chisel. But if you have that micro bevel that's set at a steeper angle than your primary bevel, then when you go to the wheel, you're just hitting that very front edge, which is the only part that matters as far as sharpness. Now with three bevels, what's nice is that super micro bevel, the smallest of bevels, I can just go straight to the highest grit on the wheel over there, my work sharp, and just a couple of seconds, touch up that bevel. No problem. It means I'm going to do it way more often because it's not an ordeal. And as time goes on, the more I work that super micro bevel, it's going to eventually get larger and larger until it becomes a good idea to actually reset my angle to touch up the secondary, be the micro bevel, if that makes sense, the, the middle bevel, um, which then w when I touch that up, I'll have a nice small super micro bevel once again. <laughs> I'm struggling with the terms here of what to call these things because traditionally it's a, you know, your bevel and your micro bevel. Anyway, the point is I pretty much never, really just never, I guess I'll say, have to touch up the primary bevel, which is most of the steel that's at the front of the chisel here. Most of the time I'm just touching up the super micro bevel and uh, some of the time I have to go back to the micro bevel. Anyway, um, you know, it's a similar concept to some people actually round off the whole front. It's actually not even a bevel. I'm not sure if round is the right word, but it's a, a graduating hill down to the point. Uh, not, you know, rounded over enough to make the tip blunt, but it actually is a, a different motion on the stone than simply creating a flat bevel at your edge. And this is similar to that, except instead of a, gra a continuous curve of rounding, it's just multiple facets leading to that edge. But the whole point of this is whatever creates a situation where you have less time to spend at the stone or the wheel or whatever you're using so that you will sharpen more frequently and the three bevels for me achieves that all right i've said enough on that topic let's uh see what else you guys got going on in the forum here i'm going to put this chisel back and we'll keep talking Okay, and there's a new member introduction in here, like I said, from Doc Brown. Let's go ahead and read that. Doc Brown writes, Hello there, David from Southern New Jersey. I am both a woodworker and a guitar player. I still have my first guitar, a 1966 Gibson ES120T. Built a few parts casters and wanted to branch out. Still watching the videos and trying to decide on a wood combination. Okay, great. Well, welcome. Welcome, Doc Brown, and you are not the only doctor in the house here. Uh, Doc Joe also posts a lot in the forums. So, um, yeah, we've got a lot of doctors. Uh, not sure if that means you're medical doctors or PhDs or uh, you just enjoy using Doc in front of your, uh, as a prefix there. But either way, welcome. <laughs> okay, let's see uh, some of your questions now. Enough rambling from me. And we have a question here from Lamar's Guitars. And Lamar writes, In a video a while back, perhaps on guitar number 87, Eric gave a source for some dyed binding and or purfling he was experimenting with 
Does anyone remember that source? I'm not finding it here. Yes, it was Gurian Instruments. So I'm going to spell that for you because uh, most people get that wrong. G-U-R-I-A-N Instruments. So that's Michael Gurian's website. Fantastic source for all kinds of interesting uh, bindings and purflings. And um, from uh, what I understand, they supply Stu Mac with their material as well. So it's good to know. GurianInstruments.com, I believe is the, let me make sure I'm not giving you the wrong web address. Uh, yes, GurianInstruments.com, and Gurian is G-U-R-I-A-N. Okay, great. And it looks like Patrick uh, found the source for us too and, and put it up on the forum. Okay, so I'll throw that on the screen. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, jumping back into a different part of the forum here. Let's see what else is going on. All right, Patrick has some uh, things going on with his build. And Patrick asks, which looks better, a maple or an ebony bridge? And he has his guitar that he's been building here. I believe it's an OM, and he has a zero coat back and sides and a lovely redwood top. Love that top. And I love the combination between zero coat and redwood. Looks amazing. And between his two pictures, let's take a look at it and make a decision for ourselves right here. I'll throw them both on the screen. I would say just go with the ebony. I think it works better. I've done a maple bridge before, and honestly, I didn't like it very much. Um, and I would, I would say the same thing here. The ebony just seems to work better. But let's see uh, what other people have said. Larry Kuhn writes, Ebony, if you're looking for reasons beyond gut reaction, number one, to me, it goes better with the grain of the top. Number two, it visually connects the eyes to the fingerboard, i.e. the line down the middle from the fingerboard to the bridge. The maple bridge makes the eyes connect the bridge and the binding together, which doesn't work as well. Conversely, I think the bindings pop a little more when they're not competing with the bridge for attention. Interesting. I like that. That whole analysis there I think is spot on, Larry Kuhn. Um, yeah, I gave my, my gut reaction there to it, which was towards the ebony. But um, I think he very aptly described why the ebony just seems to work better. I liked what he said about the bindings competing for attention there. I do think you you want to, in most cases, try and match the, the fretboard and the headplate combination with the bridge and not other elements of the guitar. No set rules here, though. If you like it, you like it. But, you know, that's aesthetics for you. And then even Patrick writes, uh, after Larry Kuhn's comment, Patrick writes, I'm liking the maple one less and less. I might try to find some striped ebony that matches the backwood. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. All right. And LC Guitarist writes, My first major amp repair, some bad solder joints, replace the capacitors, new high watt resistors, new tubes, biased them, and a new speaker in this 2002 Fender Hot Rod Deluxe. And then he's... Note of caution here, use caution if you want to do amp repair. This amp has several spots at 450 volts DC, and the capacitors can hold voltage even after it's unplugged. Don't attempt at home without training. And he's got some cool pictures here. I don't know anything about this stuff, by the way. I mean, I've touched up a couple uh, solder joints here and there. But, yeah, this is not my world. But I love sharing it, and I like seeing it. I actually like reading about it sometimes, um, just for something different. Old Apple writes, I'm real new at this. Wonder if anyone has used Mesquite for a fretboard. I used Mesquite once for a back and sides. And actually, it's not accurate that I used it. Uh, a student requested. She was from Texas. She came here to take the class, coming from Texas, and she wanted to use a Texas native on her guitar, and so we chose Texas Mesquite, 
and we did uh, Texas Mesquite back and sides. We didn't use it for the fretboard though. And so I have handled the wood. I was there when the student built that guitar. And so I remember what it was like, um, fairly hard and hardness is your primary thing here along with stability. So for a fretboard, it's hardness and stability. And I would say hardness, even more important. That's primary, that's make or break. If it's too soft, you really don't want to use it for a fretboard. And so why don't we go ahead, I'm going to look up real quick for you. I'm going to hop on the wood database, wooddatabase.com, which is what I always do when I have wood questions like this. And what we can do is we can compare this to more standard fretboard woods like rosewood and ebony. All right, so there's a couple different mesquites out there as to be expected most of the time when you're dealing with woods. And um, I determined that the one that I used previously, be because it's from Texas, that's how I was able to figure this out, is honey mesquite. So whether you have black mesquite or honey mesquite or African mesquite, that's going to change the hardness a little bit. And the honey mesquite seems to be very hard at 2,340 foot-pounds. That's the Janka hardness scale. That's what you always want to look for, Janka hardness. So that's 2340 for the honey mesquite. And let's go ahead and check out here, just Macassar Ebony for a good standard. It doesn't have to be as hard as Macassar Ebony, but we want to be in the same ballpark. So that's 3220, um, quite a bit harder, but uh, let's compare that to Rosewood actually, because Rosewood is a fine, and we could do maple as well. Those are fine woods to use and they're not as hard as ebony. So East Indian Rosewood, 2440. Yeah, so what did I say, 23 something for the honey mesquite? It's basically like rosewood. That's great, let's do maple just to be complete here. Okay, hard maple is 1450. Wow, that's pretty low. 1450. Okay, I didn't think it would be that much lower than rosewood. So anyway, you're good on hardness. Um, stability matters, but I, I don't think stability is as make or break. So obviously you don't want a wood that is inclined to cup and warp and all of that. But however, as we've talked about in previous episodes here lately, Stability doesn't matter as much, or sometimes not at all, if you know that your wood is well sourced, therefore it is well dried, okay? Um, if that is at all in question, then stability matters a lot because your wood is going to shrink or expand, most likely shrink depending on where you live, and depending on how stable that wood is, it's going to if it's unstable, it's going to shrink or expand unevenly on all of its surfaces, which is what results in cupping. But let's go ahead and do that too. Let's, um, let's check out the stability of it. So here's how you check out stability. Uh, let's find our wood again, mesquite. And again, I'm on the wood database, wooddatabase.com. Okay, it's honey mesquite, which by the way is Prosopis glandulosa, if you want the botanical name. And what I'm interested here to figure out how stable this wood is and how likely it is to cup and warp and uh, shrink or expand unevenly across its two surfaces. What I'm looking for is the TR ratio. And on this website, they have it under the title shrinkage. And so the TR ratio is the ratio between the shrinkage experienced on the tangential face of the wood compared to the shrinkage on the radial face of the wood. And so this has a TR ratio of 
And just for comparison, what you can use for that, sort of a, a gold standard in stable woods with a good TR ratio, we can use Honduran mahogany. Honduran mahogany is 1.5. So it's definitely worse by a good bit. So it's not going to be the most stable wood, but I, again, the same caveat I mentioned before applies. To me, that's not a reason not to use it necessarily. And you know, sometimes in this guitar building thing, if you want to build something interesting, you have to take some risks. That's also another way that I feel about it. All right, great question. Let's jump back to the forum and see what else we got. Patrick writes, my guitar making has been on hold while I wait for wood to arrive. While I waited, I made this. And it looks like a Adirondack double chair. I don't know what you would call that. But that is, uh, that's nice, man. That's, it's amazing how much you get done, Patrick. He, uh, he posts a lot of his progress in here, and it seems like he doesn't sleep or leave the, the workshop. You must not have kids, Patrick. That's my assumption there. Or they're, they've grown and left the house. <laughs> uh, but um, that's just me saying that from the perspective of uh, having uh, two children under three years old right now. Actually, my daughter just turned three. All right, let's go ahead and jump into your YouTube comments now. How about that? Okay, Jonah Guitar Guy writes, Good video, Eric. And he's talking about the video that I just posted on fretboard design and also highlighting a mistake that I made in slotting my fretboards. If you like to see mistakes, go check that out. And he writes, by no error of my own, I know exactly what you're going through with the tapered fretboard. I bought 10 ebony fretboards from somewhere. They are 3 eighths of an inch thick and rough, but for some reason they are already tapered. Oversized, but tapered. I just used a center line and double side tape them to the template. Okay, yeah, that's another way to go about it. In the video, I had to, I accidentally, just without thinking, cut my, the taper into my fretboard before I did the fret slots. And so I had to glue a piece of wood to the side of that taper and essentially shape that edge until I was square again so that I could cut those slots. But yeah, if you all very carefully align your fretboard on the template with double stick tape, that achieves the same thing. Very good. Thank you, Eric. Walt, this is Walter Ryder. Great recovery on the fretboard. Could you use dyed wood for the binding as opposed to the ebony? I mean, yes, but why would I want to? I guess I don't understand. Or are you talking about dyeing the wood just at the edges and, and not installing binding at all? I mean, either way, I, I would, I'm never inclined to dye woods, not because of any uh, religious conviction against dyeing woods, but um, I, I'm just not experienced with stains and dyes and things like that. I wouldn't be opposed to it in any way. Uh, that's just not the direction, I, the way that I think and the direction I'm inclined to go. Uh, plus, I love ebony. So, so yes, you could, but I'm going to use, I'm just going to use ebony there. It's not going to be an issue. Mark Pell writes, so many practical and aesthetic factors with guitar design to try and combine in the quote unquote optimum way. And it's amazing how changing certain details and relationships by a smidge can affect the entire look, feel, and or sound. That is absolutely true. Some things you just can't know until you try, and sometimes the best designs are a happy accident. Yes. Um, and then he writes, uh, as a special note there, he was talking about my layout plan here, not the fretboard mistake. That was no big deal, and all's well that ends well. Okay. Yes, I, I understand what you were talking about. Yeah, uh, happy accidents sometimes are a good thing. Okay. <laughs> Keith Short writes, My first fretboard was slotted after I tapered the sides. I vowed never again. My fourth fretboard, tapered after slotting, was tapered in the wrong direction, wide end on the nut side. Oh, boy. 
I have that scrap fretboard hanging on the wall as a reminder to think about what you are doing. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. When you screw something up, yeah, put it on the wall. <laughs> Make it a reminder. Never, never forget. Never forget. Okay. Okay, Mark Ferguson writes, I still remember the first time I saw a Floyd Rose style locking nut and being surprised that there wasn't a proper nut slot or forward edge involved. Then the first time I saw locking tuners and realizing that they really weren't locking anything. They were just making poor string winding more difficult. Nice demo, and if you didn't quite get it being a one-time thing, he's talking about my nut slotting video, Cutting the nut properly is a process. You probably shouldn't plan on rushing it and getting on to finishing something else. Ironically, I've found that with pro tools made for the task, it can be actually easier to make mistakes. Their efficiency needs to be well controlled. That's, yeah, very good comment there. There are a lot of little gadgets and gimmicks and things for specifically for nut slotting because Nut slotting goes beyond simple guitar making and it reaches out into the world of guitar techs, which there's just a much bigger, there's a lot more guitar techs than there are guitar builders. And guitar builders and guitar techs combined makes a really huge demographic to which you can sell tools there. So over the years, many gadgets have been devised to solve problems, sometimes problems that aren't really there. Uh, I've seen I've seen a lot of that in the tool world specifically with nut slotting and I think that's the point he's addressing right there that it, it really becomes a you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't kind of thing there's there's kind of no way around just good workmanship good training and slowing down when it comes to nut slotting to get that accuracy honed in very good very uh, just a, a very good insight there. Thanks for that. The Pragmatic Luthier writes, Silver maple, Acer saturinum, will also form bird's eye, albeit rarely. I have a few board feet that I have kept for 40 years. Okay, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I just did a video on bird's eye maple. That's cool. I didn't, I didn't know that silver maple can also form bird's eye. Thank you. Uh, Sean Charton writes, The tendency for sugar maple to get burn marks is because of the sugar which carbonizes with heat from power tools. I didn't know that either. This is awesome, guys. I am learning a lot. Um, it's always cool to know why something does what it does. Uh, I just knew that, <laughs> that sugar maple burns very, very easily. Um, and I always kind of assumed that it wasn't even that it burned more easily. It's just because it's so bright white that you, it was more visually noticeable. But um, then it would be on a dark wood. You might get some burning and not even really notice it. But yeah, definitely for sure, uh, that, that seems to make sense to me. It does seem like it does actually burn more readily. Skyscraper Guitars writes, Interesting to see bird's eye on an acoustic neck. The redwood will be a nice balance against the maple. Looking forward to seeing it come together. Yeah, thank you, Skyscraper. Um, I was actually just uh, talking to... If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.